gentlemen very much for joining uh, today we're going to be looking at motion and fusion 360 so basically getting things moving how we can make things look interesting um, and of course look interesting not just making it look pretty but also functional moving etc now we're going to be focusing on driving joints motion linking contact sets motion study and animation it's a lot to get through but i'm going to be touching on certain points etc um, showing you how we can get things moving. Okay, that being said, a little bit of a thingy in the background. Ta-da! Okay. Well, moving swiftly along. Uh, if I can get my team viewer to behave, that would be very nice. Okay. So... For some reason it's stuck on that specific page. Team girl, why are you stuck there? There we go. Sorry, my slideshow for some odd reason was a little bit stuck. Sorry about that. So it's moving swiftly along. So at the moment we are in the introductory phase, if you haven't guessed by now. I'm Quinn Kennedy, application engineer here at Micrographics. Um, my email address is on the screen in there. That is quinn at mgfx.co.za. And yeah, so as you can see on the little thing on the bottom right, I've been playing around, getting things moving for us. And I'm going to show you exactly how you can do this and more. So a little bit about our agenda for today. Once more, figure that out a little thing there. Um, we're going to have our introduction, driving of joints, contact sets, motion linking, motion study, animation, and then a summary and QA. So if you guys do have any queries or anything, please, um, your screen should be looking something similar to what you see um, at the moment that I've just taken a screenshot. Um, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom, ask any questions, etc. I'm more than happy to answer it. Otherwise, drop me an email afterwards with any queries or anything you've got after that. Okay, so like I said, you'll see the little button at the bottom and you can type a message. Okay, so I'm not going to, by the way, be doing a death by PowerPoint because I'm not really a fan of death by PowerPoint. But I'm going to just use this so that we can basically have an idea as to what's going on, etc. for the workflow. So the first one we're going to be doing is driver joint. So as you can see how I've demonstrated already on this image, we can then use this to actually drive and move our joints in predictable fashions or steps or even very freely, how you saw in the beginning where I actually grabbed that little um, marker and moved it around. So to actually do this, if we jump to Fusion, everything looks the same now. <laughs> if we jump to Fusion, I've got this little one open over here. Let me actually close that for now. And this is a very interesting Geneva Draft mechanism used in clocks and a few other assemblies. Now, if we go and we open up our joints, so you're going to have to have a joint, of course, in place in order for this to actually work and function correctly. We're going to have to go and right click on one of our joints. You can actually see which one it is that when I click on it, it highlights in the screen. Or you can right click it at the bottom. Or if you can manage to and you can get it, you can also right click on the joint itself. I'm actually interested in this joint over here. Now, what's interesting about this joint is that when I click on it, right click, and I go drive joint, you can see the little grip. And that's how you can move it around. Very simply. Just one, one or two things to note here. You'll notice that the little um, quick screen over here, this little uh, menu, when its number changes in your main drive joints menu over here, it's the top two are basically linked. So you're not going to have one that's sitting at like 90 degrees and the other one sitting at 180. They'll always be linked between it. This is just a faster way that's closer to your um, actual cursor, normally where it is. Um, a little bit uh, redundant in some cases, but it is there if you want to make use of it. You also do get the browse, by the way, 
and that little um, browse button will allow you to access any measurements or any, well, like in normal Fusion 360, anything that you've used recently, or even give you the measure option. So you could then measure between two. But the drive joint is probably the, the simplest out of all of these and straightforward. Uh, probably have already played around with it yourselves. Now, that being said, you've noticed that when we drove the joints, and even if I just grab this little spindle and move it around, it, it, it like tries to clip in and it clips through. So it's breaking through the actual object. And now this doesn't look very realistic. Now that actually brings us to our next point. So that was driving a joint. And it's actually quick and easy to do. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on that because I'll reiterate one or two things later on. Because the next point that we're gonna be looking at is some animation of the joints. Ah. And the contact sets. So what do I mean by this? It's actually pretty straightforward and simple. Going back one. So when we are going to be actually animating our joints, and we get to and we get two of these joints. There we go. That's what I'm trying to set. So we get joint one and joint two. And we want things to work together. We can actually do this whole thing a lot easier if we go back to our Fusion 360. We can make our lives a lot easier by just going in here and enabling our contact sets. So in our assembly, we're going to go down to enable contact sets. So what this is literally going to do is as the spindle of here moves around and it touches this part, it's going to actually realize, oh, I'm actually touching actual physical material. I need to do something. And then as it touches this part, it's going to say, okay, how can I, uh, how can I allow this to move through? And what this is going to do is it's going to actually move, whoops, it's actually going to move itself down because the only way it can move, because I've already constrained it using its joint. If I click on over there, you can actually see that joint. And that joint is free to move at the moment. Now, though I am going, though I'm going to enable this contact set. I do have to warn you though, um, straight off the bat, that enabling contact sets in large assemblies can be not the greatest of all ideas sometimes because what happens is as you can imagine if this is turning around and it touches the and it moves it looks okay it looks beautiful it's performing exactly what how we wanted to i'm actually just clicking and holding by the way and just dragging it around roughly so that you can see what it's doing now the problem here you might have already caught on that by doing this calculation and doing this um animation as to how it's be working with it. it it's actually crunching quite a bit of information to try and do this and try and calculate this and then as you can uh, probably understand is that to try and do this this is just a simple two objects that's just touching and that they only impact one another but if they were impacting more items down the line it could be a very different story if we had a hundred objects in our assembly and tried to do this it could very much bog down the machine and this would not be as smooth and you'd need one monster of a machine to actually run this. So that's with contact sets and what they do. To actually enable, to actually use the contact sets or create new ones, I've actually already got this contact set in place. I'm actually going to delete this. I'm going to disable that for a second to show you that again. So we're going to enable a contact set. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say drop down an assembly again and I'm going to say new contact set and now you'll notice it says bodies or components so we're going to need at least two bodies or components in order to do this it can actually be more in this one I actually actually I'm going to need more so I'm going to say between that one that one so the base and the little spindle sticking out and then my Geneva gear section itself so what it's going to do is it's only going to look at these three items so if there's actually a third item involved it won't actually um be taken into account that it's clashing if you want to look at it that way if i hover over here you can actually see it says select two or more components and i'm going to go okay so now 
as we're moving around, you can see it's moving through. And if I were to disable this contact set, as you can see, it actually gives its own little special place in our browser over here. If I were to right click and say suppress, you can see it just clips through. Unsuppress, and it can move through again. Now, that's a very useful and handy thing, and that's in contact sets, and we're going to use that a little bit more later on. Because what we can also do now is by using this drive, can't grab point, so I'm just going to right open up my joints, right click in it and say drive joint, and now when I drive my joint by either holding it and moving it, you can see it now moves and catches into the little slot and moves the whole gear assembly around. So this is just an interesting way that you can actually use it. Just by the way, a pro tip that you may have seen but not actually used is if you right click on any joint that has got the ability to move and you say, you might have seen these two. We'll go on to the, some of the others in a second. Well, a little bit later, but these two. Animate joint. If you click animate joint, it allows that section to rotate freely, but it's only just whatever that jo specific joint applies to. You'll notice it even leaves a little spindle behind, leaves the rest behind. Just hit escape to get out of that. And if I right click on it and I say animate model, the whole thing comes alive. So it's a cool way how to do a quick animation to quickly show people how something is actually going to be working. Because now what it's doing is it's driving those joints. Then hit escape to end that. Okay, so we went through quickly now as to animating a joint and also the contact sets. So all it really is doing there is preventing the bodies from clashing. But as I said, it can be a bit heavy on the system. Next thing, sorry, my keyboard is a little bit sticky as well. I'm really having a good time with tech today. So next thing we're going to look at is motion linking. Now, as you can see with motion linking, it's pretty interesting. And a lot of people don't understand how, what this thing is actually doing. But what it's, what we're doing here is, in this case, we are translating um, one movement to another movement. In a, and like I said, in this case being... This is a rotational movement on our back end of our handle. And then we've got a linear movement with the head. So this is basically a very poor mock-up of a vice I made just for this demonstration. So what's happening here is that for every revolution that's going around, so if we look at the top here in the motion link, angle 360 degrees, it's moving 30 millimeters. So if we jump back to our Fusion 360, and I go to my open. So please forgive the poor modeling with that thing sticking out. Like I said, this is just for demonstration. So just to demonstrate when I move this around, it's quite easily moving the vice jaw. So how do we actually do this? It's pretty um, simple once you know how, like most things, I guess. So what we want to do is we're going to come down here, assembly, and click on motion link. And then what that's going to do is when we apply, let me actually come down here and I'm just going to delete the old one off. So the old one's now off and you can see, I can spin this around and nothing happens. I'm going to go motion link. Uh, just going to say continue. It doesn't really matter what position that was in. I'm going to say, okay, motion link what joints so if you have your joints expanded it does make it a little bit easier because you can just select the first joint and select the second joint and then as soon as you select the two joints as you can see it immediately pops us forward and you can see how this thing rotates backwards and forwards backwards and forwards now it does help i'm just going to get cancel on that for a second it does help like on my slider if you right click and you say edit joint limits you can also do that, by the way, by right-clicking the little icon itself. And you can see on my joint limits, I've actually set limits already on this. 100, sorry, 0, 75. And the, all that does is just helps you constrain a little bit more so that it behaves predictably. So as you can see, as I move this jaw around, it's not going to flap all over the show and do something strange. 
just going to go back and put our motion link back onto it. And I'm going to say, okay, between that one, you notice now I'm actually just selecting the little glyph icons and it moves backwards and forwards. If you want to, by the way, you can say angle, how much it's going to move. Okay, so maybe every 180, it moves 30. Or maybe for every 180, it moves 60. So you can play around with this. So distance, so angle versus distance. Also, you could change if you really wanted to. Um, you could change the X, Y, Z if you had the option. And that's something I'll get onto now in a second is about these options. And also, you can hit the reverse to reverse it. Now, th that's a bit of like motion linking and what you can do. But that's a very interesting, uh, or how do I say it? It's a very, um, a very, uh, it's very situational on what you what you're going to get there, because as I've just shown you here, I've got a linear to rotational or rotational to linear. If, for instance, you had something like this, where you've got these two wheels. Now, let's say this is a bolt, a little bit more of a better mock-up here. Now, if these two wheels were connected via a bolt, this is double diameter of this one. So just how this thing should run is this for every rotation this one does, this one should do two rotations. So this is also just showing you as to how you can play around with this. Now, when I go to add a motion link, I'll just continue. I'm going to say, okay, motion link between that point or that joint and that joint. You see I'm selecting the glyphs now. I'm not just using the selections off there. And I'm going to say, okay, with this, let's go and say, if I hit play, we can see as to what it's doing. Now, firstly, we can see, wait a second, this is a little bit strange. The one's going in the, the one's going in the one direction. So this one's going uh, counterclockwise, while this one's going clockwise. If this was really connected by a belt, this wouldn't be possible. So what do we have to do? Well, firstly, we can say, let's go to the first one and say, the 360 and let's put negative so now it's removing the negative rotation so now they're both traveling in the same direction cool if maybe that one wasn't correct and the other one if you wanted to go the other way we can do that too it just depends on which way you swap it once again we don't have any other um uh, degrees of freedom yeah because it's only kind of that's how the joint itself is bound at the moment depending on what joint it is you'll have different options there what you can also do here is say okay well for every um let's say this is the second object the smaller one if i remember correctly so for every 360 degrees that this one turns i want this to actually spin at 180 oh and of course i'm backwards again <laughs> i always select them the wrong way around it seems there we go. So now we are saying, okay, for every 180 degrees that this is now spinning, this one spins a full 360 degrees. If you wanted to, you could um, increase the angle of this one and keep that one at 360. So um, yeah, but it's just up to you. Also, if you wanted to, you can hit the reverse and that would then reverse the object. But going back to here, this is just an easy way and just showing you that motion linking is very dependent on what joints are being linked and it will change the excuse me and it will change your outputs quite significantly okay that being said so that's a little bit about motion linking and what we can do with them they actually, it is very, very handy. Okay, moving along now. So I just spoke about using one joint to drive another joint, basically. And then also using our, ah, there we go using our motion linking 
to then translate one type of movement or one joint of movement to another. So, just a quick one, motion study. I'm going to try and hurry it up a little bit so we still end up on time. So, motion study. Motion studies are quite interesting and they are kind of poorly understood in a lot of places. And it's actually a way around a issue that we've got in uh, into the animation side, which I will speak about in a little bit. And that be, well, one of the main things being is that animation, because you can't really render it, um, it can come out looking very flat and not that great. Though this does have a huge kind of cravat in it, um, okay, right, is that, yeah, it is going to cost you cloud credits if you're wanting to do it this way around. But the motion inking itself won't. And I'll, I'll explain to you what I'm going on about now. So if you take a look at this little quick tripod I mocked up, you can see what's happening with those legs. So getting back into our Fusion 360 again, I'm going to go to my motion linking. Hey, didn't bum out. <laughs> I was a bit worried because of the internet. Okay. So to do the actual motion linking itself, now you can see that when you've got a motion link already set up, the study pop up to one of the other sides. Where are you? Okay, edit. When you have got a motion study in place, and I'll show you how to do this now, it's going to look something like this. And this can look a little bit daunting at first, especially if you see it in somebody else's screen, I know. But if we just move this up to over here, and we just want to break down this interface a little bit. So, firstly, we've got our motion study, which is divided into various steps. We've got 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. These different steps, as we're moving through, is how we break down our animation. So, important thing to note that, oh, there we go. Sorry, every time somebody joins or leaves, it seems that it uh, <laughs> bombs out the system. Oh no, sorry, I didn't realize it muted there. Ah, I seem to really not be winning with my uh, connection today. And yeah, I do apologize about that. I see that it dropped off the audio there. Oh, goodness gracious me. Sorry, just quickly rolling back a little bit. So, I was explaining about the... Oh, come on, pop up now. There we go. I was just explaining that we just previously spoke about the motion linking. Use one joint to drive another. I uh, really went through that basically just translating our rotational movement in this case into a linear movement. Here, all we have to do, flip it to the next section and we're looking at now at motion study. So basically using animation, but what we're doing is going to use our joints and our systems using that. And at first this thing can be a little bit intimidating if you look at it. It's not too bad, don't worry. Uh, it's not as bad as it looks. Now, especially when you look at the bottom here and you look at that, you think, well, okay, that's a lot of information. Don't worry, I'll explain it now. Now, if I jump back to my Fusion 360, in my Fusion 360, we've got our motion study already built over here. So it actually forms a new part in your browser or a new folder called motion studies. If I open up this motion study and I'll show you how you actually do create one of these things a little bit later, this is this very intimidating looking graph. Now, this is basically broken up into several steps. Zero to a hundred. So this is not actually seconds, it's a step account. So step one, step two, step three, etc., etc. Um, unfortunately, you can't go higher than a hundred. At this stage, it's locked at a hundred. And the only way you can really control is the speed is by using the little speed slider here at the bottom which I'll show you now. So just to click play, if we click this little button, play, looks like a little play button, 
it plays through our motion study. We can also restart or we can use our step functions. We can step forward and we can step back throughout our motion study and see how it is behaving step for step for step. Over here, we've got our um, basically a graphical display of our steps, what we're doing. And this is how we actually change it. It's very similar to a timeline in the animation, but it works a little bit differently in, in some respects. For an instance, I have got, and you'll probably have noticed this on joints, to try and get all of your joints like in a positive can sometimes be very difficult, if, ne if nigh on impossible, actually. So what these are actually doing over here is the, but above this line that you see, the gray line, is a positive representation. Below the gray line is a negative representation. This is basically showing us that our, uh, our, well, where our joints are going to be going, if we give it a positive value or if we're going to be giving it a negative value. Unfortunately, it can be a little bit um, difficult at first to try and figure out which one you need, and it may take a little bit of playing around with it. And if you look over here, I've got my, if I click on one of these lines, you can see each one of these lines is a representation of a joint. So, how does this actually start coming together? How do we actually start working with it? It's actually quite simple. For an instance, if I go and I go to my side, my left hand side over here, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to, I want to get rid of these joints. I'm going to remove that joint and I'm going to remove that one. So these little minus buttons removes parts of it. So you can actually see, by the way, I've got two sets of joints right on top of each other. If you want to, by the way, modify one that's underneath, you just uh, instead of trying to select the line, because the line you may get the wrong one, either select on the right hand side, the joint that you require, it even tells you which joint it is if you look at the name. That's why it's always a good idea to name them properly. And it gives you a bit of an idea looking at the degree of freedom or what it's constraining on the side here. And then its value, of course, what, it, what its current value, not what it's set at. That's, so that's an important thing. You'll notice that if I scrub my bar backwards and forwards, the current value changes. Now, if I select around here, yeah. okay, if I select around here, we can then go and say, okay, um, let's add a new one in. So how do we then add the new one? So I actually deleted those two off by using the minus. So I'm going to select one of my joints. You can also select on the screen, but it's generally easier to just select it off here. And as soon as you select it, you notice that I've got a new line that's now appeared. And if I look at the name of it, rev leg zero one. So I know it's my revolution. So my leg zero one, and it's currently sitting at 60. An interesting thing about um, motion study also is that it always starts as to where you where it currently how the model currently is situated. So if you've got a, um, a leg or cockeyed somewhere else or something strange, uh, and you start your motion study, that's its starting position. It's not like the rest of the things like in joints etc., where it's going to want to continuously want you to. Um, uh, say like save start this position or save at this point etc um yeah so just remember that so if you've got it opened up already you're going that's how it's going to start hence the reason why you can see it starts up over there now to add in a new point very simple you can just move your cursor down the bar and left click now if you let's say wanted your point to be on step 20 you can just click double click on the step and say 20. if the angle and then the angle let's change the angle to 80 in this case and hit enter you'll notice the model instantly updates to suit so now at step 20 it's changing from the degree of 60 to 80 and then if we go all the way down we can click on the end like I said, if you didn't get the point 100, don't worry, you can go 100. And you can say, okay, there it ends at 90 degrees. Enter. And you can see, so this is the shape it's going to take. And if we move our legs backwards and forwards, we scrub backwards and forwards, you can see 
the one that we currently are doing is this one in the background here. The timeline is kind of covering it up. Let me compress that a little bit. But if we move our screen around and we scrub backwards and forwards, you can see it's the one that the leg is not contracting. Why? Because we still have one more to do. So if I click on the slider leg, so this is the other one I deleted, it puts it back here on our list. So it's slider leg one, the direction, as you can see it's a slider, and the currently it's sitting at 10. So that's what this new bar over here is. And I can say, okay, well then at 40, if I drag and select 40, um, I actually want it to be maybe 80, enter. And then I'm going to select at near 100, Notice I can do 100 again, and I'm going to say at 100, I want it to be a distance of 90. That's just your distance of the slider, by the way. So the slider is on the inside here, running in and out, and it's 10 millimeters, by default, 10 millimeters set and offset. And all I'm doing is saying, okay, go from the 10 to 80 to 100. And the reason why I'm doing this step between that is just to create a little bit of a delay, basically, between the two steps. If you don't like a um, a point that you've already put in, like if I were to select off by left clicking and then I accidentally clicked elsewhere to put a point in that I didn't want, you can select it again and hit the minus button to get rid of it. And if we scrub our timelines backwards and forwards, you can see the legs fold in and out and also the slider goes in and out. This is also a little bit situational depending on what joints you're using and how you're using it. But this is going to be your easiest way how to do it. Uh, just a little bit of a pro tip, by the way. When you are moving these um, points, sometimes if you try and change the step value, or let's actually not do that one, let's try this one. If you try and change this after you've set it once, goodness gracious me, I am not this clicking here. If you try and change the step sometimes after it's already been set the first time, it may not, okay, now it does <laughs> decides to do it, but it may not want to change that step. It might be locked for some reason or the other. Sometimes if it goes past where it was first bound, it may give you an issue or two. In this case, don't worry about it. You, your easiest thing to do is to just remove the point and put it back in again. It may be a bit of a schlep. I do apologize, but uh, it's kind of what it is like there we go see now it doesn't want to put that in if we change the other one we may be able to no it doesn't want to put it there so it can get a little bit fussy sometimes don't get upset don't get impatient just <laughs> try it again it does it does do it eventually and now you can see it's working properly again. Just two other things here quickly, is we've been working in the forward mode, so play once. So if we play it, it just plays through and ends. Then we've also got um, our ping pong type effect. So in other words, it's gonna bounce forward and backwards, forward and backwards, forward and backwards continuously. If you don't want your joints to show, by the way, you can just also click the hide button. You've also got then loop function. So it's going to loop. But the most important part to remember here is that when it loops, it's going to get to the end and then reset back to zero again. So it's going to be an infinite loop, but it plays from the start. So it might not, it's not really the smoothest action because it jumps immediately to the beginning. Where the ping pong basically goes beginning, end, end, beginning, beginning, end, etc. And you can slowly also increase the speed if you wanted to. Notice, like I said, the value and how it's changing. So that's basically motion studies in a nutshell. By the way, to actually begin a motion study off the bat, if you needed to actually create one, then you didn't have one already, it's under assemble, assemble and motion study. And basically that's how it's going to look if you don't have anything there. And that's why you would work through it and just add all of these to your 
motion study you'd want and then adjust it as to how I've just shown you. It's just easier to show off a example that's already been built there. Oops, I didn't actually click OK on that. So I'm just going to click on one of them and I'm going to click OK. You'll notice that as soon as you add the motion study in, there's the folder I was talking about and showing motion studies. If you delete one out, it completely disappears. So that's motion studies really in a nutshell. But motion studies have got one other cool thing to them. Now, if you were, if you, you use cloud credits, this action actually be a boon. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that if you render locally into your gallery, um, you're probably used to seeing this screen. But if you've ever used cloud credits, and we take a look here, uh, okay, it's not there now because I've already done it. Ah, uh, no, okay, so watch this. I'm going to quickly show you. So when you click render and you set up your render, if you've done a cloud credit render, notice this is not local, cloud credit, and you click render, it is going to cost you a cloud credit. I did set it on standard, so it should be pretty fast. That being said, um, maybe I should not be saying that because, yeah, I've been not having a lot of luck lately, it seems, with this. But I'll come back to that in a second. While that's busy doing its thing, ah, nope, there we go. And as I was speaking, it decides to start working. I did set it pretty small, so it should be pretty fast. There we go. Okay, if you do do a cloud render, and now it's not showing on it for some reason. There we go. It's showing it there for a second for some reason. It's not wanting to stay up, probably because I've already done this on this particular model. But you see there's a little play button that pops up. That play button is actually for a motion link. And now what that motion link does is it gives you the ability to do actually what's currently on my screen here. Is that when you hit play, it, although this was a very quick one, I do admit, it can get a lot better, but it allows you to actually create a rendering and an animation on your rendering. So, as you can see, it's going up and down. And like I said, you can change this bit. I'm actually going to delete this one, because then it should give us the ability. There we go. As you can see in the motion study, if I click the play button, the motion study one, it says render settings, motion study. Now, depending on what quality you've got set over here. So if you go standard or if you go final, you'll notice that this drastically can increase the amount of cloud credits required. So it can get a little bit expensive, but the thing is it does basically the animation for you and it looks really good. And also you'll notice that your image size also does count against you uh, if you're wanting to scale up the image to something massive or otherwise count for you if you're wanting to make it smaller. And when you click render, it will then be sent to the cloud at order for, in order for processing. You'll see it here at the bottom and it's busy thinking. Me trying to be clever just now, trying to put everything up beforehand is what snookered me there at the end that because it had already processed it, processed it once. Hence the reason why it wasn't giving us the motion study symbol. Okay, that being said, let us carry on. Now, that's the ins and outs of motion study, and it can be very powerful. So, last on my list that I wanted to show you was about in the animation section. I'm not clicking the right button. So, when it comes to animation in Fusion 360, sadly, it is not the most user-friendly. Um, when I to get to there, by the way, underneath design, if we click animation, it brings up our timeline here at the bottom and a little bit more of our stuff in the top section, which I'll get to in the ribbon. Now, first and foremost, 
if you're doing any movement around Fusion, th uh, it, sorry, in Inventor, not Inventor, Fusion 360's animation workspace over here, um, make sure that if you are moving around, how if you're moving around like that, or if you are just realigning yourself to try and do something else, either make sure that you've dragged your timeline, your little cursor over here, into the scratch area. So this is known as a scratch area. It's got the little curtain icon. If you actually hover over it, it even tells you what it is. So literally, it's not gonna capture any actions that you're doing there. So remember to put your system there. Otherwise, what's gonna happen is it sees that if I move, let's say for an instance to five, and I move my camera around, you'll notice it actually puts that in the area. Meaning that if I were to move my cursor backwards and forwards, yeah, sorry, my graphic seems to be breaking a little bit. You notice that that has now been taken into accordance with the whole um, timeline. So that's just a pro tip. Leave you leave it in there. Or otherwise, there's another thing you can do in here in our ribbon at the top under view. You can click this button, and then it views not recording. And even if I were moving around normally, notice it doesn't record that. Okay, that was a little bit of just to make your life easier. Now I'm just going to quickly explain what I mean about some of these things I've been telling you about. So firstly, when you enter the animation workspace, I'm just going to do this in a nutshell because we are running out of time here. Um, we get given a few options. So firstly, we have got our components. You can see as I expand it, we've got our various sub components and sub assemblies and main assembly. Now it's just a good, it's just going to make your life easier if you work like this and work with proper um, sub assemblies and split things off uh, and just think about your animation when you're going to be working with this. You'll also notice here in the timeline it actually shows you as to what is active and what's being worked on. So if we look at rotor you can actually see what is being used in that rotor. Cross you can see it's got two objects in there. I'll get to those now in a second. Also we've got the ability to work with storyboards. So Think of storyboards like um, either separate or interacting um, animations within your animation. So you've got one storyboard, so one section, one chapter maybe of it, and then you've got the next chapter or maybe something similar. Or you could also just use these to be completely separate to one another or be leading on to one another. Like I said, almost like a chapter versus chapter scenario. So storyboard and then X. So I'll explain what I was doing there now in a sec. Now, to do this type of thing and do the animation in here, it, although it can do it, it can be a bit finicky and difficult to get it, and honestly, this is not my favorite way of doing it. This is more of a graphics way of doing it in that you are, uh, what I mean graphics, like um, media entertainment way of doing things, in that we, we're making things look like it works, not that it may actually work. Where previously with our motion studies, etc., we actually used joints. So, in other words, we would we were driving it with how it was put together. With this, we're just doing a visual movement. Well, a visual way of doing it. And what do I mean by that is, if we click transform components. So transform components, or off the top there, transform. So all a transform is, is basically, it, it could be actually several different things, but in this case, it's more about moving the parts. So if I were to, in this case, click I'm actually going to right click and delete that transform off. You notice that it disappeared. Even my component that was affected disappeared off our animation timeline. I'm going to select transform. And I'm going to select the object to transform. By the way, if I just selected the base, it's only going to move the base. And I actually need to select more parts of the object. The problem being is that Doing it this way is going to be difficult because it's only selecting the parts by default. So a better way of doing it would be to actually expand my components list, find the entire assembly, click on it, and then it adds the entire assembly to my list. Cool. Next thing I need to set its pivot point because at the pivot point I'm not, it's pivoting around a very strange point. So I'm going to say, okay, pivot point around that area. And don't forget, once you've set your pivot point, so the reason why I picked, by the way, this section is because I know it is concentric to the 
shaft. So I just picked this outer edge and it's concentric to the shaft's um, center over there. That would be very situational as well. Don't forget, once you've set your pivot point to click done, because if you don't click done, it's going to confuse you with the next part. Now with this, what I'm going to do is you can use your X, Y, Z and just type in what you want here. Or in this case, just to save time, I'm going to just drag this. You'll notice that I can drag it around as much as I want. So if I drag it to 275, notice that my X changes to 275. Um, by the way, if you're doing multiple objects at once, you can use the split transform option to try and break up the objects a bit. For what we're doing here, I'm not going to do that. Just to also be running out of a little bit of time, so I'm going to click OK. Oh, and I messed up there. Let me just quickly do that again. Transform, rotor, set the pivot. Accept, rotate it, and accept. Oh, for some reason it's not wanting to try uh, do it there. Ah, sorry, just my system is lagging a little bit it seems. Uh, so I'm just quickly control Z it back. Okay, so once it's done and it decides to sit on there properly, you're going to be given a object. So let me just explain what I'm talking about over here now. So in here, unlike what we did with our motion study, we have got now this little bar that we can drag across. And this little bar basically is saying, where are we sitting on the timeline? Now... Oh, okay, so that's why I was derping out a bit. So basically, when you drag the, the bar out, you're going to say, okay, whatever action you're busy doing, it is going to be within this time frame. So in other words, if I actually delete this one off, and that's the reason why I was derping out there, because I was doing this before putting my timeline bar out. So I should have actually explained this first, sorry. So this timeline section over here, you're saying wh wh where the action is going to be occurring. So the action that I'm about to do is going to be occurring at um, over the 10 second mark. So this, like I said, uh, sorry, unlike the motion, it doesn't work in steps, this one works in seconds. So at 10 seconds, this is where whatever action I'm about to do is going to take place. And you'll notice the colored section of the bar represents as to how many seconds have already been taken up by animation. Hence the reason why you'll see I've got two transforms over there. So just quickly doing this again, not to confuse us and not to make myself derp out again. Setting my pivot point it's in the center, accepting, and then, uh, goodness gracious me, I need to remember not to select the part. And you'll notice that when we move around, There we go. Now, now we're cooking with fire. You can actually see now that the rotation is now in the place it should be. The reason being is because <laughs> when I was warning everybody, I said, make sure that you, when you're moving around, make sure your timeline, your head is actually in the scratch area. I didn't have it in the scratch area. So what I was telling it just now was basically create a transform, but have no time in it. So it couldn't create it. But now that we've dragged our bar out to 10 seconds, we now have given it time. So I'm going to quickly step back a little bit to go to my original. There's a very good reason for it. Because, because this actually has a very interesting point that I just wanted to raise here. Now, you'll notice, like I said, put the view not recording on. You'll notice that one of the major disadvantages about doing it this way is that if you're doing something like this rotation, you know that there's, you'll notice that there's no way to prevent it from clipping through things, such as other objects. But what we can do is we can try and go and balance several of our rotations.
around. This may be better in the top view. And of course it's now changed its axes, so it's just making my life a little bit more difficult. If we click here at the bottom, we can click play. As you can see, it's clipping through. But what I could do is keep playing with these. So all I do basically is I would drag these timelines around so that I could get them to suit a little bit better. It is a little bit of a finicky job and it's not the cleanest way of doing things, I'm afraid. But it's just kind of your best way to do it. The reason why this type of thing breaks and the reason why I'm showing in the Geneva job is because of... This is a very unique situation where it's going to break and it's going to break and give you a hassle. And what I'm just trying to show you is a way that you can use to fix it. So all you do is you would assign multiple, uh, multiple transforms to the specific item. So in this case, I was quickly selecting there and tell it to spin around a little bit more. Okay, so literally, as you can see, this new one that I've just created here, they can be different times, but if you time it just right, you can make it work. It's going to be a little bit difficult, and it's not going to look very neat, I'm afraid, right now, but with tinkering, you can get it right. Sorry, I know I've hopped on about that, but this is just my personal, one of my pet peeves about this, that it doesn't work the way it should. Otherwise, apart from that, when you're done and dusted, you can also publish out a video straight from your storyboard or all your storyboards into whatever information you want. Because we're kind of almost out of time here, I'm just going to quickly explain one or two more things about the other storyboard I've got here, X. So that is actually for Explode. One cool thing you can do with this, you do get a lot of other things you can do here in the animation side, um, but the main things here is our exploding. So exploded views. You can try and use Auto Explode. Though, at the moment, it says no components available because of where it's nested. It's deep down in the assembly. But what you can do is you can use the manual explode. And you can use this to pull the items out. Ah, sorry. There we go. So it wasn't wanting to scale properly. But yeah. So as you can see, as I pull something out, this is the thing I was just wanting to make, uh, make you aware of. Just be careful of this. If you do pull a object out, it is going to leave stuff behind unless you've got it all selected in one object group. So I just wanted to show you this before I demonstrated the better way of doing it. So. This is the reason why I'm being fanatical about certain things. So when you click the transform, Malino Explode, select not just the item you want, but all the items it's connected to. And the easiest way to do this is to use just control, select the items, everything that you require, select the object arrow, which is showing you direction of your explode. And then you can actually go and change it from there. Oh, goodness, I grabbed the wrong one there. Oops. There we go. And once more, exploding. That's what I keep doing is I keep selecting through the part. But now you see on this one, I've selected one of the other parts that's through each other. So you can then go and turn on your line visibility as well. The main thing I wanted to show you is not just was the exploding, because that's just, it's just an interesting part of what you can do with the animation side. But you'll notice that it each part creates its own little movement there. And if you wanted to, to actually lengthen 
or constrict it, you can actually lengthen or constrict these movement points by just dragging them backwards and forwards. By the way, you can do that with any one of these parts as well by just manually dragging the section around. And if you wanted to, you can also right click and you can say, you can tell it to start end. So you can give it a manual type in and you can type in the amount that you want or you can do quite a few other things here. But the other one that I just wanted to show you before I end off because we've run out of time is if you right click and go edit action, you can actually tell it to, like you can see, I dragged it up that way. Instead of going that way, let's rather go that way and that way. And then when we scrub through, obviously you wouldn't explode it like this. But you can get away with doing this. Uh, edit action and There we go. Normally what you do is actually do it at two steps. So it would go up and down and around. But that's what I was just trying to get at. Okay guys. So, sorry, I do apologize for the uh, little bit of the breaks and jumps around. It's been a little bit of fun today with our internet. Um, the main thing I just wanted to say uh, before I end it off is you'll notice that with this animation it's limited in what it can do. I only showed you a section of what we could do there um, due to time constraints. But if you do have any queries, um, please let me know. So do I have any queries about something I've shown you recently? Oh, during this, should I say. Like I said, I do apologize for the breaks. I do apologize that this thing was all over the show. Um, it did kind of <laughs> throw me a bit off there. Oh, no, that's great to hear. Um, Robert, thank you very much. Um, if you do have any queries about what I've shown you, like I said, this was just a quick intro as to how you can add, add some of this motion into it. Um, please don't hesitate. Drop me an email, etc. with this. Um, and I'm more than happy to go more with it through you. Okay, so that being said, we've got our different offices throughout the country. So MGFX, I'm in the D Durban branch, by the way. And please don't hesitate to give us a shout, either by call, email, etc. And if you need to get hold of me personally, there's my email address. Please drop me a mail. I'm always more than happy to answer a question or two. Otherwise, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Ah, thank you. Um, thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.